Hi everyone, welcome back. Charlie Delto with uh, the lecture on post-structuralism, moving into postmodernism. Post-structuralism is almost synonymous with postmodernism in in like modern everyday speak in our own word games that we play every day. It's technically not correct historically. Many of the people that we call postmodernist, uh, Jacques Derrida, um, Michel Foucault always describe themselves as post-structuralist. I think only Richard Rorty ever really described himself as post-modernist. But uh, let's deal with post-structuralism first. In, in everyday language, you can confuse post-structuralism and post-modernism and get away with it most of the time. It's very radical. If you go looking online, you won't find much about post-structuralism on reputable philosophy sites. I went looking on plato.stanford.edu and uh, iep.utm.edu, two of the most... Uh, reputable philosophy sites on the internet and they don't have any sort of page or classification given over to post-structuralism. It has pages and pages and pages. Both of them have pages and pages on logical, logical positivism, which we've already discussed, but not one page on post-structuralism. However, you're going to find lots and lots on post-structuralism and post-modernism on the internet from the, the fringy left-wing sort of YouTube and activist sites. Much of post-structuralism and post-modernism doesn't even uh, refer to philosophy anyway. It's, it's, like a lot of uh, new architecture gets called postmodernist, and there's a branch of philosophy and history that's postmodernist too, but we're specifically going to keep it to philosophy and as much as we can to epistemology within philosophy. One of the things you've got to know, it, they're anti-Marxists. Don't confuse them with the Marxists. They disagree with the Marxist version of history and they're anti-Jean-Paul Sartre, who's a, a left-wing French existentialist. Don't confuse Jean-Paul Sartre with being post-structuralist. He wasn't. Uh, let's go back and begin with structuralism for a second because that's where it all begins. Signs, because there's the signified and the signifier, and a signifier is a sign. Signs are not defined by their history nor with direct reference to objects in the world like the microphone nor by word games like Wittgenstein believed. Rather, they're defined by their relationships to other signs, so cats are noisy and goldfish are whatever, as I said, easy to kill with food or something. Uh, Redback spider has a relationship to dangerous, even though it might well be unfounded. What the post-structuralists did was to apply structuralism to the human sciences, philosophy, psychology, history, that sort of stuff. I know that's hard to understand, but look, let's give this a try. Take any word, let's say the word love. Love has had many meanings in the past, like diachronic over time. It's had many meanings. It's had relations to many other words. The meaning of love is defined by other words. You go to the dictionary and look up love, it will refer you to more words. Love is da da da, whatever it is. Those words are then defined by other words. The word love gets used in different contexts. Sometimes it's a joke. Sometimes it's said very truthfully to another person. Unfortunately, sometimes it's said very fraudulently to another person. Love can be used as a weapon. It can be used as a peace offering. It can be used from a mother to a child or from a football hooligan to their favorite football player. Which is the real use of the word love? The word love has all of these meanings bundled up in it. Indeed, all these wor the words love and the words that define love have been used billions if not trillions of times and all those meanings are bundled up in the sign love thus we can never know the full meaning of the sign love there is just too much baggage with it i don't believe that just as a side issue i think that i can use the word love to my wife and she gets the word game she gets the context and she knows i'm not speaking to her in the same way that a football hooligan speaks it to his favorite player or something like that but nevertheless, this is the post-structuralist opinion. When an author writes the word love, he or she knows what they mean, but does the reader. And this is one of those well-worn parts in philosophy, that structuralism is how the author writes the word and chooses of all the words they can use, they choose the word to write because of its difference to the other words rather than its reference to the object. However, from the reader's point of view, the author can't communicate the context of why they chose that word and not others to the reader. The reader may read their own context into it or their own reasons for choosing it. So let's do structuralism first. Consider the word love as it's used in Harry Potter. I'm going to assume that everyone's read the Harry Potter books. When Lily Potter dies to defend baby Harry, that's, uh, Dumbledore describes it as a sort of magic called love. 
Now consider love as it's used in a different book, Fifty Shades of Grey. Very different meanings. In Harry Potter, the word love isn't actually used very much. There's seven big books. There are very few romantic relationships in those books, to be honest. Even between like uh, Molly and Arthur Weasley and Tonks and Lupin, which are the, the two sort of love stories, they actually really talk about love to each other. I would suggest that the two major themes in Harry Potter that involve love are between Lily and Harry as maternal love and Snape and Lily as some sort of unrequited love on Snape's behalf. And a very lasting form of love that motivated Snape to do some very brave things. I would say that the word love when used in Harry Potter is pure and untainted with being used over and over again or thrown around like confetti. So when Dumbledore does describe that Harry's mum died to defend him as because of love, it's a very powerful word. It's used to really great effect in the Snape and Lily uh, backstory. However, in a soppy romance novel or Harlequin novels like Fifty Shades of Grey or Twilight, where that girl works out, she, that 16-year-old girl works out, she loves a 300-year-old vampire on her first day of school, yeah, she might be using the word love there, not the same way that J.K. Rowling has used it in Harry Potter. So it, it's pretty overused in, in romance novel and, and very, very close to other words like lust or want or need or take and it becomes messy and perhaps hard to know whether the hero and heroine really loves Edward Cullen or she's just got Stockholm Syndrome or something like that. Eventually we work out that the de definition of love is being used by reading the book and I think it forms a sort of Victor Stinian word game and we the, the reader come up with our own version of love from the book and if the author's good then they've been able to convey the way that they meant to use it to you. From the author's point of view, the signified is the love that exists in the story and the sign is the word love. Clearly the word means different things in the context of Harry Potter and Fifty Shades of Grey, like they're completely different books, but it's the same word, same origin, different meaning. So the author gets to choose the sign, the sign's use, and the context, etc. Right? So that's structuralism. Now let's consider it from the reader's point of view. Let's take another example. Let's say a mother writes a little note, I love heart you, on a note and puts it into her, you know, four or five year old's lunchbox for his or her first day of school, right? So the, the kid's got to get to school. First day of school, probably be a bit homesick, a bit lonely, opens the lunchbox. Lovely note from mum, I love you. The kid feels better. Well played, mum. Good move. However, let's say the note becomes lost and it somehow blows and finds its way into the school bag of a 16 year old girl. She's single, uh, she finds the note and thinks, oh my God, I love you. Some secret admirer has put this in my school bag. How exciting, what a, a romance. The context of the note was the mother's, sorry, the context of the note was written, was written by the mother. She chose the words, I heart you for their kid because assuming the kid can't read but would know what that would mean because they have some sort of relationship at home, the mother and the kid, but that context cannot be conveyed to the 16 year old girl via the sign. It gets interpreted as a romantic gesture by the 16 year old girl when it was meant as maternal love to a scared kid. To the reader, the context in which the signs were made does not transfer across. The sign is read in whatever context, so the sign is read in whatever context the note is read, not written. So that's post-structuralism. Another post-structural position, which I touched on before, is that all, uh, all words are defined by other words. So if you take the word love, you go to the dictionary and you find the definition of love, it's defined by more words. So then you go and look up each of those words in the dictionary to find out what they mean. Still more words and more words and more words, and no one can ever fully understand what the world means. So all words lack any real meaning because they're all defined by other words that have to be defined by more words. Again, I don't buy this. I think I can define uh, clap quite simply. Ready? You don't, don't need the dictionary. I didn't need any words for that. I can define um, blue t-shirt with a black pineapple on it here quite easily. I'm not sure I necessarily, either I don't understand that point, but I'm not entirely sure that point's correct. I should point out here that this point was made by a guy called Jacques Derrida, who you probably might well have heard of. He was a very famous post-structuralist philosopher, and a lot of other philosophers 
think that he was taking the piss and they don't count him a philosopher at all. They think that he's more of a historian and was doing some enormous prank upon the world with his writings. Anyway, I don't buy that point. But to the post-structuralist point, meaning is uncontrollable. Either the word carries every meaning that it's ever been used of ever with it and the meanings wash over you like a tidal wave or the author can never give you the context within which they wrote it to you definitely. And I'm, okay, in the example of the note written to the boy that goes to the, the teenage girl, yeah, I can understand how she would get that wrong. But in the example of Harry Potter, I think J.K. Rowling's used the term love very well. I mean, I think it came across really clearly. I feel certain I know what she means by it. But anyway, both structures say meaning is uncontrollable. There's just too much. And so the reader of all words is simply repressing massive amounts of meaning to arrive at a place where he or she can understand the sheer huge volume of meaning that is bursting out of every word ever spoken. And this means two things. Every word we speak is a lie, or more accurately, by the time the words we speak get interpreted, they are lies because they can't possibly take with them the entire meaning that was meant to be conveyed. The second thing it means is that each of us get to discriminate which meanings we oppress. So some people see, say, the Confederate flag and all the thousands of meanings that pour forward out there, they repress them all and think terrible flag, slavery. Some think home, I grew up with that flag on the back of pickup trucks or whatever it was, or flying out the front of the colonel's yard or something like that. Some people might think brave men of the South that marched on and did their duty because they had to when they weren't political men and they died and that's very sad. And some people think of the political issues around federation, that the federal government should butt out of the South, the Southern states are trying to control the Southern states too much or whatever the issues around federation were. And depending on who you are and what your framework of beliefs are, you'll repress certain meanings that flow forward from the Confederate flag to choose the meaning that best serves you. You get to choose which meaning you think is best. Some people see Africa and see invaded continent or colonized continent rather than see the birthplace of humanity. Some people then see England, the island of England, and they don't think invaded island, which it was. I mean, England was invaded by the, the Angles, the Saxons, the Romans, the Danes, the Normans, Vikings. So they don't see England as an invaded island, but the same people might see Africa as an invaded continent. They see Africa as the birthplace, or they don't see Africa as a birthplace of humanity because that's just the way their minds work. But surely Africa has both meanings associated with it. People don't see England as the thing that ended slavery. They sent the Royal Navy down the, the western uh, coastline of Africa and blew up all the slave forts and, and put an end to it. But some people choose to repress that meaning of England, and I suspect it's purely political for why they do it. How do we make sense of all these discriminations of meanings? To post-structuralists, everything is difference. You can't have man without woman. You can't have light without dark. You can't have tall without short. In a move that involves making value judgments, something very hard to do, we don't really know what a metaphysical definition of good is, and something that I've avoided to this point, post-structuralists believe that one term is always privileged over another. So man is always privileged over woman in the post-structuralist way of thinking. Light over tar, dark, tall over short, sane over insane. This is unfair and unjust in my opinion, but it's just my opinion. Why is it to be born a woman? You must be placed behind the eight ball. I mean, like, there's certain readings of history that people roll out to suggest that women were oppressed, but there are certain readings of history that... Uh, if you believe them, the women were brought inside the castle walls and the men were, were sent out to fight the Hun and just annihilated. And then the king made a peace agreement and the women mostly survived and the men mostly dead. This idea of, okay, I can get the bit that there's a flood of meaning coming out of words. I think we use language games to work out what we're talking about. Post-structuralists say, no, 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 no. There's just all this meaning. And you repress a whole bunch of meanings and cherry pick the meaning that you most like and that, that there's an unfairness in that but also that words are defined by difference, that man and woman, and one is the oppressed term, the woman obviously, and one is the, um, the more highly valued man, for example. That isn't immediately clear to me that that is rational and epistemically correct, but I think a lot of people find some politics in it and so they accept it because it's politically expedient. 
One of the other claims that post structuralists have is when we speak of something, we could, in theory, use infinite words. When I speak, say, of my, my Fender Stratocaster that's sitting over there, I could say it's, it's high quality, it has a rosewood neck, it's about 20 years old, it's expensive, it's classic, it's got extra light strings on it. Uh, but if I were to ch say something like, my Fender Stratocaster is expensive and just leave it there, then perhaps I do it a disservice. If my Fender Stratocaster, which is a guitar, by the way, people, if you don't know, if my guitar could speak for itself, it might say, hey, why are you calling me expensive? Why can't you call me classic? I prefer to be called classic. In a more realistic example, if I had two friends, say one was white and one was Asian, and, I, and they were both doctors, and I introduced them to someone, and I said, hey, this is Gary, he's a doctor, and this is Brian, he's Asian. Brian might say, hey, 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 why did you call me Asian? You didn't call him white. I'm a doctor too. And this necessarily implies that it's better to be called a doctor than to be called whatever your race is. I can understand what they're saying when they say that. It's, it's a disaster of a discussion because it involves meta-ethical definitions of good. It's very easy to cherry pick the ones where you know, you'd much rather be called a doctor than you know, if one time you got done for jaywalking. And they said, this is my friend Gary, he's a doctor. This is my friend Brian, he's a criminal. Now, technically that's true, but it was jaywalking. Why am I choosing that particular piece of meaning to apply to my second friend? It seems a disaster to try and do this with all of communication. Because really what the post-structuralists are saying here, that all speaking is a form of violence. Every time you ever speak, you're either repressing words, like calling my guitar expensive rather than classic, repressing words or discriminating every time you're doing it. Like, why did you choose one thing and not another? It's here that it's probably a good time to talk about postmodernism. The postmodernist approach technically is something like this. The world is by now the post-war period, so hopelessly fragmented and torn up that there are about 10,000 language games going on at any point in time, here, there, in another country, in different parts of colleges, between different colleges. Now, one point of view is that we should unify them all and have a universal tribe or something like that and choose a, a universal framework and have one singular web of beliefs or one singular framework so we can all have the same set of values and the same beliefs. Again, I'm going to come back to dating here. I think dating is a good example. If one guy goes out on a date and one woman is, is very loose with her meaning in words and is in, enjoying the male's discomfort and his cluelessness of exactly what she means and this is exactly what she wants... And she's being very vague and flirting her guts out. That's one particular language game. I think that that language game does exist out there in some women's attempts at dating, or at least um, strategies for dating. But if the same guy goes out on another date with another woman who's very no-nonsense, very specific, very deliberate about the choice of words, and expects the male to take her literal meaning very seriously because it's very important to hear, here we have two language games. And for the male that's dating, it's an extremely serious context that has dire outcomes if he gets the language games mixed around. If he takes the floaty girl as being everything she says to be true, he's just not going to date well. She's looking to have a bit of fun and be a bit loose with the words. To the girl that says, listen to me, listen to everything I say, it's very important. If you say, ah, oh, whatever, I know you don't mean that, uh, -uh that can go very badly. The postmodernists say words have infinite meanings and why prioritize one meaning over another so both games are valid we can't say one game is right or wrong and that's why i choose this example because we seem especially in the me too era to definitely be saying be very careful with your words and say the right thing all the time but if and when you meet the postmodernist community perhaps online perhaps protesting at the front of uc berkeley or whatever they actually seem quite rigid about the meanings of words that you aren't allowed to have they don't seem all that tolerant of many different frameworks. They seem very intolerant of many different frameworks. A good example is the word girl. Sure, it definitely can serve to infantilize a female. If I were to meet AOC, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, and refer to her as a girl, she might say, man, I'm a damn senator or congresswoman or whatever she is. Don't call me a girl. And she'd be well within her rights to say that. So it can definitely serve to infantilize a female, but it can also be a flattering colloquialism for a woman, again, perhaps out in a day. Rather than embrace the diversity of the meaning and the freedom that comes with it, so I can use the word or not use the word, 
I've always found that the average postmodernist will harass you for violence in language if you choose to use girl as opposed to woman. Postmodernism became political pretty quickly. It can be used to silence people, obviously. Uh, a politician that says, if only I could find a way to say that my opinion was completely valid. Well, postmodernism gives you that opinion because, you know, all sorts of values are, are perfectly acceptable. There's no one true way of doing things. Postmodernism is a very relativist uh, philosophical opinion or philosophical undertaking. But it also gives you the way to attack your opponents to say, you just use violence in your language. Why did you choose that term? And if you can get an activist mob behind you, you can silence people pretty easily. You can label language as long as it, sorry, you can label language as wrong as the same time as you say, hey, there's no such thing as truth. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. Now, it's true that both sides of politics are guilty of this. Conservatives will try and regulate everything from family, you know, anti-gay marriage, for example, to immigration, to drug use and, and blasphemy rules. But the rules are the same for everyone. Like, no one should be able to, to, to take drugs or no one should be able to, I don't know, immigrate or whatever's going on. With postmodernism, saying all white people are evil is actually quite acceptable. I myself have heard it said in a class at university by the lecturer. But the same statement made about another race would go down like a lead balloon. The rationale, of course, being that we've always said that well, we haven't said in, throughout history that white people are evil because we haven't been able to have the perspective that slavery and colonisation and a lot of the terrible things, bringing of diseases to countries and stuff like that. We weren't able to express that opinion, but postmodernism allows us to say, well, there's, there's infinite meaning in words. And one of the meanings that come out with white people is that they're terrible for some of the reasons that we were terrible. It is one of the meanings that goes along with white people. But then if you would ever try and make that same statement about another race, surely that same, if we are true that what another race of people has infinite meaning with it, I think you'll find that you're only allowed to speak about a certain sort of meaning. And indeed, I find it is the postmodernists that do a lot of the repressing of other meanings themselves. My point is, man, you can't separate postmodernism with politics. And just as in the last lecture, I said that critical theory took off because it was it fled through the sorry it spread through the universities and because it's quite self serving to some people. I mean, as far as I can tell, there's no way that postmodernism should hang around as an epistemic theory at all. But you can see how politically useful it is. It allows every sort of opinion because they're all valid because there's infinite meaning, which allows your opinion. But then it can say to someone else. You're being discriminatory and you are repress repressing with your words. So it's, it's very politically ex ex uh, expedient for those that want to use it. So one of the great post-structuralists who we call postmodernists is Michel Foucault. And I said back in the Descartes uh, lecture a long time ago that there was a paragraph about, but what if I'm insane? What if I have an earthenware head? And Michel Foucault went to the point in saying that Human beings are, were invented in the 17th century, specifically in that book that I read you, Meditations. And his point was that, let me get this straight, Descartes could have said, Descartes made the point that I could be wrong because I could be crazy. If I was an insane person that thought something insane, that's wrong. And Descartes never really bothered to say why it was wrong that insane people shouldn't be trusted. I suppose his point is they couldn't reliably describe the world. They couldn't look at a, a, a house and say it's a house. They look at a house and they'd say, I don't know, something, something some crazy person would say. And Descartes was saying, yeah, sorry, Michel Foucault saying the word crazy has a great many meanings. You know, these meanings flow forward from it, infinite meanings. And Descartes has just said irrational, can't be believed and has created insanity on that day. And so the... The same people were what Michel Foucault was saying. They're humans. They're the ones that look at a house and say it's a house. But when a crazy person looks at a house and says it's an elephant or something like that, why is that invalid? He's got a different perspective. Funny that is, even this was considered racist by the philosopher Cornel West because in doing so, Michel Foucault assumed that European people defined what it was to be a human. What if there was an event somewhere else that was just, a valid, uh, just as valid outside of Europe that defined human? Indeed, Michel's Foucault that humans were invented in the 17th century is Eurocentric and racist itself. 
So one thing that's very closely, very, very intimately linked with postmodernism is the idea of colonialism. You'll always hear those things move together because postmodernism has the idea that you can't have men without women. That is, everything's different. So that is, there's a man, there has to be a woman. If the woman is domesticated, the man has to be undomesticated because there's relations between those terms and the terms define with their difference. And so colonialism allowed Europe, because Europe had always been like that French hated the Germans or the, the Germ French hated the English or whatever it was, Spanish and Italians. But when Africa was discovered or America was discovered or Asia was discovered, it allowed for Europe to come together and say, well, we are one and they are the other. And so there's this idea of the other. So Europe actually got its like, well, the theory of the postmodernists is Europe didn't get an identity until it found the other, the thing to be different. And once, let's say, Africa was discovered, now you could have difference between Europe and Africa. And so we weren't always just talking about like France versus Germany or something like a different form of uh, difference. Consider human rights. Human rights can be problematic if human rights are like the ultimate good or justice or righteousness or whatever human rights are, this really good thing that we all have to have. And they were invented in Europe then doesn't that make Europeans the creators of the good thing? That is to say human rights. So therefore, human rights can be racist too because they were invented in Europe. You know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and that sort of legacy back to Jean Locke and the, where human rights came from. Uh, Thomas Paine, was that him? Anyway, so even human rights can be have... There are different perspectives on human rights. One of those came out of Europe, one of them came out of Asia, maybe one of them came out of Africa, one of them came out of America, or perhaps you put race aside all together and say it came out of Islam or something like that. The world chose the European version of human rights, therefore it represses everyone else's version of whatever their human rights are. Consider people with handicaps. Why do we say that there's a normal state and then there's the handicapped state? That is to say, Healthy people or non-handicapped people are the, the thing that's highly valued and the other is the handicapped person. Well, you know, like I said that in men and women, women are repressed and men are like more highly valued. When we discuss people with handicaps, we're saying that they are the other to the healthy person. Consider the beauty of bodies. Why are we saying that thin people are attractive and overweight people aren't attractive or in men, Short men aren't attractive and tall men are attractive or something like that. Again, we're discriminating against short people. We're discriminating against overweight people and we are repressing them. And they're both as valid and neither can exist. You can't be thin without be someone being overweight. It's a relative term and we preference thinness in terms of beauty over overweightedness. Phew! So all of these hierarchies, these spectrums, these others, men versus women, thin versus fat, handicapped versus non-handicapped, they're all actually constructions of power to the postmodernists. They don't really exist. They're just there. So to create the other, we did not ever need to the postmodernists to label overweight people overweight. We could have just said they're people, right? We only ever said they're overweight to create thinness and then we value thinness more and thin people find it easier to get jobs and thus it's all about power. All these norms, these, this thin versus fat, it's just tools of repression. To call someone smart as opposed to dumb is repressing dumb people. To call people beautiful as opposed to whatever ugly is to repress the ugly person. And the difference has to be there to make beautiful. So you can't have beautiful without ugly. Young is to repress someone that's old. To say human rights is good or great represses all those who didn't invent human rights. To say that there are women and trans women is to create trans women as the other. So women must become cis women, not just women. So they can't just be women and trans women. That's to prejudice the trans person or repress the trans person. So there should be cis women and trans women and they're both equally valued and we're not allowed to do any sort of hierarchy and if there was any hierarchy going on it would just be constructions of power Whew. so what's the solution to celebrate this difference or as it is more commonly known diversity seems to be the solution the american president lyndon johnson lyndon johnson once once introduced martin luther king jr and said he is a credit to his race the human race. 
and you can see what he's doing there. He's being like a, a liberal and he's saying that like when there's no such thing as black and white, there are only humans, right? You can see where he's going with it. But from the post postmodernist point of view, he's denying Martin Luther King Jr. his difference. If he was to declare Martin Luther King is black and is different and that difference is good, and I'm Lyndon Johnson and I'm definitely white and he's Martin Luther King and he's definitely black and there's value in both things to the postmodernist, that's a better statement than to say, let's leave color out of it, we're all just humans. So if you prefer thin people to overweight people, you are creating a hierarchy and you are discriminating and you're affording thin people power. You must find, I assume, overweight people as attractive as you find thin people, unless you're being a horrible bigot. So you must treat people the same, celebrate the diversity, Overweight people have to be as attractive as thin people. I'm thinking a huge percentage of the population might find this difficult to reconcile with their own biology. Postmodernism is really difficult to make work if you haven't worked that out already. You can almost, you, you have to value everything good and that effectively destroys value. When you value everything good, then there is no difference anymore. But difference is what makes this all work. And, that when I got this camera ready, I got the lights ready and I got the camera in the right place and I tried to stand in all the right place. And that's because I had a difference between light and shadows and I didn't want shadows. And I tried to make this uh, online course. I wanted sound not to be too loud nor to be too quiet. I needed that difference and I had to discriminate. Postmodernism is almost impossible to work, but it is politically expedient to those who wish to use it. So again, we've got through postmodernism and we've barely touched on like any sort of effective way of building epistemology. Postmodernism seems just a disaster and it, it is alive artificially because it is, it's expedient to some people. There is another postmodernist philosopher that I want to touch on right now, but I want to keep him totally separate from everything that's just, that's just happened. I believe this guy did actually refer to himself as Postmodernist, and he's an American called Richard Rorty. And loosely, Richard Rorty, pretty, if, if Wittgenstein didn't kill philosophy, then Richard Rorty did. In fact, famously, he said, philosophy is dead. He said that foundationalism is completely wrong. There are absolutely no foundational truths whatsoever. Nothing, there is nothing that can confirm something is true. And his opinion on what truth is, and this is the one sort of takeaway point that we can get out of postmodernism, is that when we say something's true, we're not saying, you know, I have a hand, it is a hand. Correct, we've, we've, we've established a real truth. We're saying you have a community, you have a culture, and then you make a truth claim. Like I might say, uh, this is a black microphone. And everyone would come along and say, yeah, it is. And if everyone does say, yeah, it is, they're just validating my attempt at this proposition and they're saying, that'll do, pig, that'll do. We'll accept that. The reality is, if I want to get into it, I could say, this is a black, meshy thing with two knobs and there's two knobs and an emblem and a cord and a screw goes in here and it attaches to a handle and that would be just as valid. But I know if I said that to my society, they'd say, shut up, dude, I'm not interested in hearing any of that. Just say the line and I'll say, it's a black microphone and they say, yeah, right. But really, they're just validating my statement. There's nothing that says this really is a black microphone. We can't ever validate it. Sorry, we can't ever confirm it. But like almost like by popular opinion or like by some democratic process, we seem to have agreed that this is a black microphone. And so that's what we call it. And so there's, it's not truth. It's just an agreed upon term that we should use, right? And again, this is fairly postmodernist. And after this, they're really is no truth but that which we agree on. But it still leaves us in this risky place that what happens if a minority of the population, a very small minority of the population, and perhaps politically motivated, comes into control of that process of how we agree what terms should or shouldn't be used. Think of truth as an endorsement of your statement. It is a black microphone. Everyone looks at it and said, yeah, I'll endorse that statement. It's like a compliment or something. True just means you've passed my test, nothing more. So this isn't all that bad. I mean, if I think the traffic lights are red, I have a test for that. I apply the test, they are indeed red, so I stop. Everyone else seems to have a similar test 
and they all stop and so the traffic lights work and after 10 years of having red, orange, green traffic lights, the traffic works well, everyone's validated, everyone's uh, endorsed the test. Rorty's saying that it's completely unfathomable for the philosopher to put himself in a sort of a God's eye view and look down the world and say there's some greater truth and the lights are red than that. Truth is just what works. And so if the cars stop when it's red and everyone agrees that this is a fair test of what red is or what stopness is or, or what the rules should be, then that's as close as we're ever getting to truth. Now we're at a point in time now where postmodernism is terrible. Richard Rorty himself says philosophy is dead. Wittgenstein says philosophy is not very helpful. The next lecture is going to be about well, where to from here. So this is kind of like the post-philosophy lecture coming up. That was a long one. That was a tough one uh, for me as well. Uh, I'll see you in the next lecture and uh, goodbye for now.